Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nicole Quadra. I'm Programming and Outreach Manager for San Mateo County Libraries, where our tagline is open for exploration. Today, I'm here to talk about the Lookmobile. Um, the Lookmobile has been called a mobile observatory, a learning lab, a museum on wheels. Um, unlike a bookmobile, the Lookmobile doesn't contain books. Created in collaboration with San Francisco's Exploratorium, the Lookmobile was designed to bring hands-on, inquiry-based learning outdoors to create an inviting, highly visible, and welcoming public space, attracting new library users, non-users, or lapsed users who might not realize how awesome libraries are. This is a view of the Lookmobile on opening day, December 2016, at the East Palo Alto Library. One of our library's strategic goals is to cultivate an active presence in our communities and create spaces that support discovery, enrich lives, and uplift the community. The Lookmobile offers tools and activities for seeing the world from different points of view. It was designed to encourage people to linger, to take a closer look, to experiment, create, and reflect upon the world around them. This is a view of the interior of the Lookmobile, and it really is quite pretty. The Lookmobile consists of six core interactive experiences, all designed to encourage open-ended discovery, um, includes tools and activities for seeing the world from different points of view. Um, the visitor moves from light to the dark. Um, visitors are invited to draw their friends and surroundings using the perspective window. Lenses flip the view upside down. Evocative maps reveal surprising ideas about places you thought you knew. Visitors are invited to pin their own creations on the walls around them. The Lookmobile is an evolving work in progress adding new elements and linking communities as it travels throughout the county. Starting on the outside, visitors are greeted with the map wall. Maps were chosen for their quirky character or particular way of communicating information and because they show more than geography or political boundaries. We want to show that maps also represent values, different points of view, different perspectives. And I just want to point out, I don't know if there are any fans in the room, but I believe that is a Settlers of Catan <laughs> game board. Missing a map of Westeros, though. So we're going to have to, so these, ma these maps can be swapped out and changed. So I think that'll be in one of the next installations. OK. Visitors are then invited to make their own maps drawing what is familiar and has personal significance for them. Uh, visitors are encouraged to express their neat, unique perspective on the environment and their place in it. Selena has drawn, well, we have a lot of maps from her, and they're all, <laughs> they're equally <laughs> colorful and amazing, and here I think she has, she's drawn, um, I think the road from her house to her car, her family car. This one shows North and South America with Venezuela lovingly uh, highlighted, I think. This one is just showing a lot of California love, I think. And this next one is my absolute favorite. It's really faint, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I thought I would, might trace over it, but you can see that um, Emma has drawn a dog, or she has mapped a dog. Um, which I think is awesome. Love it. Moving inside the Lookmobile, there are more maps and a perspective drawing window. Visitors can trace their friends and surroundings um, from inside looking out. The window helps you draw with accurate perspective, capturing scenes as they appear to your eyes. Um, it's often quite surprising to people how perspective makes very large things quite small in a drawing. 
This man is drawing that large truck parked outside. Built into the trailer's front section, a wall of pinhole cameras projects images from the local landscape into the trailer. Each lens has a different focal length, which results in slightly different images and different depths of field. This is a closer look at the dreamlike light of the pinhole camera wall. And um, this is a view of the pinhole camera wall from the outside. Again, it is quite pretty. Uh, friends like to look at each other through the pinhole camera wall. Uh, the camera obscura is located in a periscope um, poking through the top of the lookmobile. Light is bounced through a, from a mirror through a lens and then focuses on a white tabletop. Um, visitors can um, turn the top mounted camera, turn it around like a periscope to look at their surrounding environment. And then last is the fog tricycle. It's an open-ended exhibit designed to get people to experiment and play with fog. The fog trike reproduces our region's distinctive fog belt uh, on a portable scale. Visitors blow, push, and swirl thick clouds of water vapor, replicating the fog formations that cling to the San Mateo County coastline. So I'm going to wrap up with a few slides that show how he, we have used the Lookmobile to cultivate an active presence in our communities um, in our outreach. Uh, here a hiker explores the Lookmobile while stopped at a trailhead in San Pedro Valley Park. This is one of my favorite stops ever. Um, it was a beautiful day. You kind of can't tell, maybe the sun went behind a cloud for this picture, um, but there are about five trailheads that lead from that particular spot. Um, and it just had a really nice synergy with its environment there. Here, a community member explores the map wall um, at East Palo Alto Library. Um, at Sun Ridge Elementary School, a teacher brings her very well-behaved class <laughs> to visit the Lookmobile. Um, a class of middle schoolers visits the Lookmobile at Valamar School in Pacifica. And here those Valamar students work on their maps. So these young people are at the San Mateo County Fair, and it looks like they're collaborating on a map. And this is another group at the county fair last summer. This is the fog trike at the county fair. And I really like this picture. These are um, young scholars from our Big Lift Inspiring Summers summer camp, uh, checking out how fog is made with the fog tricycle. The Lookmobile visited um, all of our camp locations this summer. And then here, I'm going to attempt to play. Hey. Just a young child playing in fog. <laughs> All right, so thank you. I'm going to leave you with this quote from a Lookmobile lover um, and then introduce you to my colleague, Sean Lanny, with the Exploratorium Studio for Public Spaces. Thank you. Love that video. Love that video. Um, that level of engagement, I mean, we, we use a lot of words for learning. Play is an excellent indicator 
of engagement, of investigation, of investment. Um, and it's one of the hallmarks, I think, for the kind of what we mean by informal inquiry. It looks just like that. It sounds a lot fancier. It's better for getting the grants. But when we say informal inquiry, that's what we're looking for, is that's that sort of behavior. Let me see if I can get this right. Oh, yeah. So we, uh, we started looking outdoors eight years ago at the Exploratorium as a potential of, of expanding our impact as an institution. So if you think about outdoors uh, spaces, we generally think just outside the doors of our institutions because that's um, probably the easiest place to put stuff outdoors and take care of it. But as we started to investigate the potential, we started thinking, well, why just outside the doors of the institution? Why not say somewhere like on Market Street in San Francisco? So three years ago, we got invited to do what they call the Living Innovation Zone. And after bobbing about for a while, we thought, well, uh, let's try something that we know works well. They're listening vessels. They're uh, eight feet in diameter, and if you, there's two of them out there. And if you sit in one, uh, you can whisper to somebody 50 feet away on Market Street. So you can talk to a total stranger, anybody. And if things go south, you have a 50-foot head start. <laughs> head down market, because what you're doing here is you're breaking all the rules on how to survive in San Francisco on Market Street. You don't look people in the eye, you don't talk to random strangers, you don't put your bag down for any given reason, and you don't turn your back to, uh, to long alleyways like this. And, and it turns out that this installation was like a wrecking ball for those social norms, that human freeway out there where people were passing by each other, and became a really important gathering spot and actually led to some really interesting discourse between people that otherwise might not have spoken with each other. So this bench was also located in that, it's a singing bench, so if one person has their hand on the metal on the left and the other has the hand on the metal on the right and they hold hands, music starts to be generated. And if you touch fingertips or kiss, uh, the sound tones change because the amount of conductivity shifts. And so we were really focusing on uh, getting people to, to move beyond uh, the way that they saw, not only things like sound and how sound moves, which is all very technical, um, but think about how they themselves are generators of place, and they themselves are generators of culture. They make a place by the way that they behave. And by giving them that sense of agency, you can call it civic agency, it actually it fundamentally shifted people's perceptions of Market Street and their role in the daily lives of, uh, as they move through the, the city, um, their roles as active players. And we were also able to engage what we call the indigenous phenomena of a place. So before, we might have made an exhibit about sand and water, and it's all very beautiful. Um, when we got to the location, we actually dredged the bottom of the bay, and we brought these dredges up and put those in these thin shells of water. So when you spun it around, you saw basically uh, what made up the, the, the bottom of the bay. And then you got to look at, like, well, why is the sand there and why is it so silty there? So it's really kind of a blueprint for how the bay works. And so this intrigues us. Um, and then when we talked about the locomobile, we said, well, if we're going to roll into town, you can't just roll into town in a gray box, right? So we were looking like, well, um, we really want to, we want this thing to be engaging. We want the locomobile to be something that, um, it's like a circus comes to town, right? You, you, you throw a little glitter in the air and have a bullhorn. Um, so looking at San Mateo, the county was really intriguing to us because it was huge. That is a huge county and extremely diverse. So not only with um, the economics, but the socioeconomics and the settings and the, the variety of, of ways of living. They're all, they're all kind of um, in high relief. I mean, if, if you travel enough now in the world, you understand just how much impact this region has on so many people's lives worldwide. And so looking at this as an opportunity, um, we were also trying to service individual libraries. So what are the needs of the libraries? And, and whatever we do has to work in all these different settings, right? So we got really enamored with this idea of map making. Map making is, uh, it's a, you saw those drawings, right? I mean, you can actually give a little bit of yourself when you make a map. You don't have to make a map. And we wanted to make sure that the maps weren't seen as purely ge geological or geographical. Um, and maps are about power, too. Whoever draws the map are setting lines and setting rules. And so in some ways, by drawing a map or making a map, you're saying, this is my family. This is what my daily commute looks like. This is how I see my home and my place. And this is who I am. That's what that map making exercise is about. So again, we get back to that sense of agency, that sense of making is important. And we were inspired by you know, a lot of weird things. Um, looking through uh, for ideas, um, if you're going to look at the landscape, changing your view or perspective or framing 
is often an excellent way to reconsider what you think you already know about where you are and who you are and how you fit in. And so we went through a number of different um, ideas and permutations. Things might unfold, things might uh, zigzag or, or accordion. One of the big problems we had, or the challenges we had, was ADA accessibility. So trailers are fantastic if you can get up into the trailer. So um, we found a trailer that actually squats down to the ground. And they make these for um, really expensive car toys that go up to Sonoma and race around in tracks and can't lift more than a couple inches off the ground. Um, but the nice thing about these is it allowed us to have full access without having to do something like this, which is a ramp. So this is an early sketch. And so as the idea evolved, um, this whole idea of something that was accessible, that had different compartments associated with it, so the dark end with the camera obscura and the pinhole camera back to the more active map making to the perspective window, which got you kind of out of the cerebral into the actual observing, um, matured into an increasingly um, dynamic design. Um, and, and then, I, you know, it's funny, I was telling her before, this didn't start, like we didn't go to San Mateo County Library and say, hey, we really want to build a trailer. They actually approached us looking at outdoor public spaces as additions to libraries. And that, that is the focus of, of uh, the Studio for Public Spaces is, is enlivening these public spaces because they're hugely accessible. You know, only 11% of people go to museums. And I think if you're arguing that you have social or cultural impact, it's difficult to make that argument with such a rarefied audience. And so working in public spaces and, and taking full advantage of those learning environments is something we're very much interested in. So the Lookmobile itself was very much considered a prototype by us to get to know how libraries work. What, what, what can they offer programmatically? What do they need? What, what do their audiences respond to? Um, and by having a, a platform to drag around, we actually had a rolling archive. So when people made maps, those maps get stored or they get displayed, and you get a little bit of where that trailer's been left behind as evidence of what really makes up these counties. And so um, with that in mind, the way we got to the final um, installation was through prototyping. This is uh, Becca, who's an architect, and this is Hiba. Hiba is, um, she was visiting from Palestine. They're starting a museum from scratch in Palestine. If that sounds easy, it's not. They, they, they have challenges um, that are difficult for us to understand, I think, but amazing spirits, and they were out here, there were 12 of them out here for three months, and she helped prototype the pinhole camera wall, and here's our, our chief engineer. We're sitting in a big um, cardboard box that we built with lenses, and it is as fun as it sounds, um, and that's the, our studio back there. And likewise, we did this with the maps, so if you want to have an, an exhibition that, that invites people to make maps and, and uh, gets over the phobia of drawing, like if you ask them to draw a house, they get a little nervous, or draw a cat. But what we did, here was the trick, we put us some really crappy drawings, like really bad drawings, and we made sure that like, oh, I could do better than that. And that, that got them over that hump, you know? And it also, I think, um, it got people thinking differently about what it was that they were mapping, not only like how do I get to school, or where does my best friend live, um, but this is a map of uh, my heart, it says. So it's my grandma, my grandpa, my wife, there's music involved, the mom and the brothers. This is a map of how they live and where they live. And I thought that was really um, sweet and telling that people were willing to kind of share um, when you asked them in the right way and you gave them a tool to express themselves um, who they were and how they thought that they fit in the world. So the Lookmobile, um, not complete. I don't consider it complete. It's only been out there for a year. We're learning a lot about the functionality of it and what kind of care it takes. Um, I think the potential of uh, combining moves like this with outdoor public spaces and libraries that are taking advantage of their immediate um, parks. Many, you know, libraries have an incredible set of assets. Um, and, and if their locations are amendable to having those outdoor spaces be um, part of their ongoing programming, I think that would be um, a, a bold move because it takes commitment. But from what we've seen and experienced over the last four years at the Exploratorium, we know that the learning outcomes and potentials are far broader when you're in context of people's, what they consider their kind of normal day-to-day -day lives. And so even though it's outside the library, it's still outdoors and in a public space. And, and I think when you change the context um, in that way, you're opening up possibilities that simply don't exist inside institutions that are traditionally educational institutions, but, um, but probably programmatically 
uh, set or habituated to, to offering a certain kind of program. This is um, an example of an extreme, I considered it an extreme risk. Um, we put in, and these are still just outside, if you um, swing to the west in UN Plaza, you'll see a set of five outdoor installations. Um, this is an echo tube pointed right at City Hall. There was a little label there, it said, it, said, um, uh, it was just a little teeny label, and it said it takes uh, about it takes two seconds for sound to reach City Hall and about a week for them to get back to you. Or maybe, maybe it was a month, I forget. And then, yeah. Um, so we had a sense of humor about it, but, but um, this exhibition and, and, and uh, Ray up in that corner there really taught us that people are absolutely critical to making these things work. If people aren't there mediating it and helping people through it, not caretaking, like, you know, get off that bench and don't crawl on that, but really engaging people in a way that, all these people are local from Hunter's View family, so they're, they're from the area. A lot of them have training in dealing with people that um, are um, often considered problems for San Francisco, and, and they have a way of, um, well, when we designed this, initially we, we were thinking less about sound and more about kind of social balm. Like how do you make this more human? How do you, how do you, um, humanize a space that it seems so desperate sometimes and so empty and desolate but it, it doesn't matter where you're from or where you are in life when you're doing inquiry and playing and learning it kind of humanizes you and, and it equalizes you in a way that's really unique and I think that was one of the big surprises of working in UM Plaza and also the idea of, of building I'm running the last slide um, for open-endedness is really important so she came along with her violin and started playing and I thought that was wonderful because we didn't build it for violin players um, but we didn't build it for not violin players so I think keeping that the the opportunity and the just the pure potential open to and to your users to, to decide how they want to use and what they want to do what they want how they want to use the work is really an important part of making these places work okay do I have a thank you at the end? Oh, there it is. <laughs>